Aaron and Bonnie are so gracious, and this church is too, by the way. I'll let that slide. Uh, I'm so glad to be here. Thank you so much. My lovely wife's in the back with the yellow on. Been married 40 years and uh, never thought about divorce, but yeah, thank you. Divorce has never come into our mind, but killing each other has, so. Uh, <laughs> you know, there's some things that are just really important to me, and you know, the older I get in Christ, it seems like sometimes God begins to change your focus and direction and begins to give you a message, a life message, that you want to share, and mine is just really the grace message. You know, over 40 years of serving God, I made a lot of blunders, a lot of mistakes, and. I always like to lead people in grace, and I hope I can do that. Another thing that troubles me a lot, too, is because of many people who I've walked with in the past are no longer walking with the Lord, and I'm concerned about that. You know, Jesus said, will there be faith on the earth when I return? And he underscores the very fact that it's not easy to be a Christian. It's not easy, again, to have the answers at times where you really don't know what to say to people because you really don't know what God is up to. It reminds me of the story about a man who lost his dog. I think many of you remember that story. He put up a poster and read like this, lost dog, three legs, blinded in the left eye, missing the right ear, broken tail, and recently got run over, and he answers the name Lucky. Should I say that again or you didn't figure that one out? He answers the name Lucky. And so oftentimes we, we think that somehow if we serve God, everything's going to just be perfect, just perfect. That somehow this relationship with the Lord, we cut covenant with God. We said, God, okay, we'll do this if you do that. And in reality, sometimes it seems like God doesn't uphold his bargain. You find yourself in the midst of divorce. You find yourself lost in a job. Maybe you lost your finances. You find yourself at times maybe in not good health. And you wonder, God, why didn't you keep your side of the bargain? I kept mine. I've been tithing, reading, praying, going to church and everything else. And, and that concerns me because the man who led me to Christ 40-some three years ago, 43 years ago in a liquor store, is no longer walking with Christ. And that disturbs me immensely. The man who brought me into the kingdom no longer is embracing the kingdom today because of issues in his life, hardships in his life. And one of them was is that when his wife was pregnant, she had a terrible reaction to her pregnancy and it affected her face and she broke out terribly and that she was in severe pain that she had to abort the baby. Not long after that, she was diagnosed with colon cancer and she died. And you begin to wonder, why does these things happen and why do people lose their faith? One of the other outreach churches we sent out, we sent one out to Sonora. And I remember uh, when it was Miles and his wife and they were pregnant and they had a stillbirth baby. And I officiated that service, and I'll never forget the image in my mind. He walked up with his baby wrapped in a blanket, and he placed it in a little coffin. A pastor. One of the pastors that I served under for many, many years, his daughter, who was pregnant, was murdered by her husband, stabbed a myriad of times. There's things that happen in God that we have no idea what goes on. And at times we just feel like, God, I, I'm not sure what's going on. And so he tells us, can we find faith on the earth, particularly in the last days? So I think faith at times can be an endangered commodity. It's such a precious gift to have faith. But at times, again, it's so fragile that it can be taken from us. It risks extinction. The Bible tells us hope deferred makes the heart sick. That's in Proverbs 13, 12. Delayed hope, delayed hope. You're believing God for something and you're praying and you're hoping and you're hoping and praying. And this goes on month after month, year after year, year after year. And finally, you just realize, why pray any longer? Why is there so many atheists today? It's because God doesn't answer prayer, they believe. They pray, they've tried God out. And yet God doesn't seem to show up. Many have lost their faith during a long, weary interval without seeing unanswered prayer. Prayer being answered, I should say. You know, and it's really difficult. And I'm sure some of you feel the same way. Little by little, faith can be dwindled and fade away. Crisis of faith is what they term it. It's a term that's applied to periods of intense doubt. Intense doubt and internal conflict when one's preconceived beliefs just don't seem to come to pass. You know, those are tough times, and there's so many people that seem to be in that area. 
Maybe it's triggered by just one event. Maybe the loss of a child, loss of a job, whatever it might be. Or it could be built up by just a sense of general dissatisfaction because when you pray and pray and pray, nothing ever seems to change. Faith is so fragile. Today I want to talk about desperate housewives. It is a reality show that many of you watch. Yeah, right. No, of course you didn't. But there are two women I want to talk about today. And what I love about this portion of Scripture is that they both envied each other. And how often we seem to envy one another, don't we? We want each other's gifts. We're not satisfied with ours. We want what they have. We want this or that and so forth. But let me, let me just give you just a, a little foretaste of what really was going on there. There's a man who married this beautiful woman. I mean, they were really in love. There was only one woman for this man. And there's only one man for this woman. And they poured into each other's life and they built each other up. And it was a wonderful relationship. And uh, somehow they weaved together this commitment and dedication that was just beyond comprehension. She married the right man, it seemed like. And he, he really married the right woman. But over a period of time, he saw a defect in his woman's life, his wife's life. There was something that was missing that was disturbing him. And so he went to his wife, and I'm paraphrasing this. He said, listen, you know, you know, we got an issue with this defect in your life. What if I bring another woman into our relationship? What if we build a crowded relationship? What if I bring another woman? And we don't know what her response was, but it ended up that he did. This man had two wives. His name was Elkanah. His first wife was named Hannah. His second wife was Peninnah. And so things kind of got ugly there. There was rivalry as it often is in a polygamous relationship. One woman wanted what the other one had. The other one wanted what the other woman had. What did they have? Hannah had the love of her husband. He truly doted over her. He affirmed her. He appreciated her. Oh gosh, he thought she walked on water. Peninnah wanted that. But Peninnah had something that Hannah didn't have, and she wanted it so bad, even though she was the most loved of women. Peninnah had children, and Hannah did not. And that's probably one of the reasons why there was two women in Elkanah's life. Because he wanted to establish, you know, his name to last forever. He wanted a legacy of children, and Hannah just couldn't deliver so this is the story that we're going to look at today. When God seems to be distant or God seems to fail us, when we're disappointed with God, and if you haven't been, you will be if you're in Christ for any length of time. Because there's a mystery in God that I have no easy answers. I mean, if you're looking for some, I don't have them. I'm still struggling at my head, you know, in my head, scratching my head, wondering, God, what are you up to? But this is what we see in this portion of Scripture. It's an overview, if I can give you a story, an overview of Hannah's story. It's about her pain. We'll look at that, and then we'll look at her prayer, and then we'll look at her praise. Her faith in God is shaken. Her faith in herself is shaken. She has been without child for all of her adult life, feeling that she's not a complete woman, feeling that somehow she doesn't measure up, feeling that something is missing in her life. Her faith in others are shaken. It seems like nobody can commiserate with her. Nobody understands her pain and her sorrow and her suffering. She feels isolated. She feels all alone. And then finally, it's in her church. Faith in her church is shaken. Because she's treated with disdain and disgust. Father, we thank you that you're going to allow us to have opportunity into truly what life is really all about. Sometimes it's really about hardships and struggles and sometimes we try to wonder what in the heck you're up to. Help us, we pray today, as we study your word. Amen. First Samuel 1, 2. Repeating what I just shared. Elkanah had two wives. The first was Hannah. The first, the first was Hannah. The second was Peninnah. Peninnah had children. Hannah did not. And I just love to underscore that in my Bible sometimes. I'm reading out of a... a a paraphrase. I won't even give you what it is because you probably hate me throw stones at me. But it's a paraphrase. And the reason I'm using that today is because we're not doing a verse-by-verse -verse really teaching, expositional teaching. We're just sharing the story, a narrative. And I want you to jump into it. I want you to be a part of it because you are a part of it. Because as we go through our life, you will realize at times that you can identify with her pain, her loneliness, 
the taunting that she experiences, the guilt that she feels, the shame that she endures, that somehow she feels stigmatized, that she just doesn't fit in. There's something about her that's missing. There's something about us that's missing. It's a story that's made up of hurt, of envy, as I shared earlier, of hopelessness and helplessness. And have you ever been there? If you have, you can get into this story. It depicts, the scriptures tells us, it depicts a woman feeling the struggles of infertility. One out of six women know what that's like. And if you're here, my heart goes out to you. And though I'm not really going to talk more beyond that except what's in here, you, you're in our prayers. The road of infertility is one of pain and struggle. It's one of loneliness, of deep anguish and heartache. That's the truth. As you just get on the internet and you read about it, you realize there's a social stigma about being barren today. You know, you've got to go to baby showers, but you'll never have a baby. You know, people ask you, how come you don't have a child? That goes on and on and on. And for the Jew, it was the most ugliest thing for a woman to experience. It was the mark of disgrace and, def and defect. You don't have a child. And you call yourself a servant of Yahweh. Elohim. Every woman in that culture wanted to have a baby and hoped that that baby one day would be the Messiah. Victims often suffered depression and anxiety, social isolation, self-esteem. Those women felt devalued in their culture. And we think about in our society today, our social stigmas in our society today, just physical deformity, look at this nose, just think what it's like to be me, be raised for the last 64 years with a nose like this. I went to high school one day and a guy says, man, you look like you've got a, what did he say, a battleship? He said, you've got a, what's an airplane carrier, you know, on, on your face. And I said, what does that mean? He said, well, it looks like you can land a lot of planes on your nose. You know, that, that's, that stayed with me, and it still bothers me. That's why I still talk about it today. That social stigma, there's something about a physical deformity in your life. Maybe there's obesity in your life. Maybe it's your gender that you just don't fit in. Maybe it's your sexual orientation. Maybe you're struggling with that today, and you don't just seem to fit in anywhere. Maybe it's your race. Maybe it could be a disease. Hannah felt defected. She felt broken. She didn't feel like a complete woman. And many of us men feel that way at times, too. What I envisioned for my life, I have never achieved. What I've hoped for, I've never again been able to grab a hold of. There's deep grief in a lot of our lives. There's deep loss. There's anger. There's disappointment. We feel so unfulfilled at times. And here's this woman who's feeling that same way. Her infer infertility was shaking her faith. And I would need to ask you, have you ever felt crushed in your soul? Can you identify with this situation? I'm sure you can. So we look at her pain, her suffering. Verse 3, every year this woman went from, excuse me, every year this man, Elkanah, went from his hometown up to Shiloh to worship. Where was he going? He was going to church. Remember, every Jew was commanded at least three times a year to go, go to Jerusalem or to Shiloh and worship. We're assuming it's Passover here. He's dedicated, he's devoted, he's a God seeker. But he's got a wife that's barren, so he had to marry another woman. And don't forget, God commanded, the creation mandate was this, I want you to be fruitful, I want you to multiply. That was the command of, of God to every man and every woman. And here's this woman trying to obey God. She has the command of God. She sees it in God's word. She's asking God to fulfill it, and he doesn't show up. If the man doesn't work, he don't eat. Tell people that today, that are in line, trying to find a job after losing one. The Bible says if you don't eat, if you don't work, you don't eat. All right, God, it's in your word. I accept it. Okay. Why can't I find a job? Why well, am I embarrassed? Why do I have to be on food stamps, God? The Bible says the righteous are never forsaken and his seed are never begging bread. God, why do I find myself in these conditions, God? What is it? Are you mad at me? And the retribution principle in the Old Testament was this. If you're bad, God would punish you. If you're good... God will bless you. That's why Job is so important to us, because we believe that's not true. The good people do suffer, and we don't understand at times why. So he goes up to Shiloh to worship, going to the right place for the right reason. And he offers a sacrifice to the God of the angel armies. And there was Eli there, the priest, and his two sons, Hopni and Phinehas, served as the priests of God there. 
And when Elkanah sacrificed, he passed helpings from the sacrificial meal to his wife, Peninnah, and to her children. I want you to underline that, man. And to her children. Important you get that. And to her children. Part of the tithe was spent on bringing offerings to the Lord. And then God just said, I want you to just enjoy my presence. I want you to eat and celebrate part of the offering. I love that. You're going to do that on Easter. You did that on your, your uh, dedication service a little while back. I mean, God likes to party. I like that. And he said, bring your offerings. We'll rejoice together. And so he does. And so he gives portions to Peninnah and her children and his children. But the blessed but here, I wonder if it's blessed. Verse 5, but, but he also gave an enormous generous helping to Hannah because he loved her so much. Notice that on your screen. And because God had not given her what? And God had not given her what? children. How do you think she felt every year going up to the temple, to church, to worship, to walk by the nursery and hear all the babies screaming and crying in there, see all the kids having fun and every mother's child looked like her but yet Hannah had none. What's it like to feel barren in church? Somebody you just don't fit in, they just don't understand you, they don't get you. What's that like? There's times in my own church at times I felt that way. Reminds me of that old story that I've shared hundreds and hundreds of times. You know, when my mom woke me up one day and she said, you got to go to church. I said, Mom, I don't want to go to church. I don't like church and they don't like me. She said, you got to go to church. I said, give me one reason I have to go to church. She said, because you're the pastor. <laughs> but God did not give her children. But he gave Penn and I children. And could you imagine every time that Penanai is pregnant, she's having a shower, baby shower. And what does Hannah feel like? Every, seems like every year this woman's producing babies and Hannah cannot have only, cannot even produce one. And I'm thinking, I'm sure I'm thinking every month she just still believe in God. God, this is going to be the month I'm going to skip my my monthly problem, and uh, I'm going to be able to declare that I'm pregnant. And month after month goes by, hope after hope goes by, delayed hope goes by. Another month, another month, another year, another year, three years, five years, ten years. Hope deferred, hope delayed makes the heart sick, the scripture says. There are four people that play a big role in Hannah's life. It's God which really symbolizes her faith. Penanai, which symbolizes her foe. Elkanah, which symbolizes her family. And Eli, who symbolizes her faith family. Here's the three F's there if you want to write it down. Let's talk about God for a moment. We kind of share that, that verse 5 says, God did not give her children. Do you think she was struggling with her faith at that time? infertility and maybe wondering what God was up to. Do you think she felt broken and defected along the way? Felt like somehow God let her down, struggling with that. Probably angry at times, I, I, I can only imagine. There's times where we all felt that maybe God has let us down and there can create a profound anger and disappointment with God can take place. I'm sure, I'm sure you felt that way at times. God, what are you up to? As I said earlier, others, it could be sickness, it could be a death, a divorce, it could be financial ruin, it could be that. In those moments of crisis, our faith in God is so challenged. Our faith can be so shaken. We could say, God, I'm angry. I'm angry. And I've been thankful that God has been good to me in those times that I've struggled with him and told him I'm angry and I feel disappointed that he still allows me his grace. We had a young family in our church not too long ago. In fact, Aaron helped me do the service. I think her son, their son was about six or seven years old. His name was Christopher. Christ-ofer. The Christ one. And... Uh, 
they were celebrating a party, and I think it was a little league game, and you know, the season came to close and all these kids converged to a pool, and most everybody there were, was either in Iraq or Iran, or, or, yeah, Iraq and Iran, no, Iraq and what am I thinking, Afghanistan. They were in the military, many of them were, were firefighters, others were EMTs, some of them were doctors, and all the kids were swimming in the pool, all swimming in the pool. And they asked their son to come out, Christopher to come out, and he did come out, and uh, they were ready to leave, and Christopher said, can I just go back in one more time? And reluctantly, her mother allowed him to go back. Moments later, he was at the bottom of the pool. With all the EMTs, with all the firemen there, all the lives that they were able to save, you know, because of their abilities and their talents and their skills, they were unable to save this boy. You know, that was really hard. That was really hard for our church. It's hard for a parent, and I see him, and every time I see him, I always ask him, how you're doing, how you doing, because I'm always concerned about their faith. And they're so, so open with me and, and, uh, and honest, and they just say, we're really still struggling, but we're hanging on to our faith. I won't always be here. We mostly be here on Sundays. We live 55 miles away. We live in Jackson, California. And I have other commitments there still, and uh, I'm a hospice chaplain. I deal with people at the end of their life. I deal with people who are dying. And I deal with family members who not only are losing the member that I'm ministering to, but they've lost others along the way. And it's a rewarding job in so many ways to be able to be there during that sacred moment when somebody passes. The other day, I got 10 minutes late for my patient. She just passed. But I'm ministering to the family, and you know, how you doing? And, and then they tell me they've lost another daughter previously to this daughter. I had someone in my church that lost three sons while I was pastoring her. Those are some difficult issues that, that I face at times, and that's why at times I struggle again at times is preaching the Bible and saying that God's good and he's good all the time, and I believe that he is, but sometimes it just doesn't seem like it to some people. Some people are called lucky or unlucky. I should say. Well, anyhow, as we move on here, I, I want to share something I got off the internet the other day. And I looked up, why do people lose their faith? You know that probably a million people every year leave the church. You know that? Those statistics are startling. A million people leave the church every year. There's something happening in the church. There's something happening in their lives that's caused them to leave the church. Maybe they won't leave the faith, but, but they're leaving the church. And we'll get in as we look at that. But here's this man. He asked this on answer.com, yahoo.com. He asked, I lost, my, I lost my faith in God. How do I get it back? I pray and I really don't feel anything anymore. And then here's the response. You're beginning to realize the fact that there is no God. Congratulations. How would you like that? As a reply, someone else says, sorry, no genie can ever be put back in its bottle. Once you've seen reality, it cannot be undone. That there is no reality in God. That God doesn't show up. Where was he again in the tsunami? Where is he on that airplane, Malaysia airplane? Where is he in that flood in Washington? Where, where is God? What do you tell him? Well, we believe that God is there somehow. Though we're not seeing, he's there. God is there with those who are digging other people out or firemen running up the Twin Towers trying to save people. God was there. But it's hard for people. It's hard for us at times. There's no easy answers, but there's one thing we do. We have a choice. We either can run away from God or run to God. And though we might run away for a time, I pray that we will find our way back home as the prodigal did, realizing that we'd rather serve God than not. So these things can drive wedges in our lives. So I want to move on, Chris, quickly. Her foe, notice this, verse 6. I want you to feel this. I want you to feel this. But her rival wife, look at that in the scriptures. But her rival wife, I don't like that taunted her cruelly, rubbing it in and never letting her forget that God had not given her a child. Where are they at? They're in church. They're celebrating. 
They're worshiping God. They're celebrating the sacrifice. And you've got this taunting foe that's rubbing it in that God has failed you. God has failed you. Just as I read there from that guy, I've lost my faith. How do I get it back? They taunted him. and said, you're, you're so lucky you finally came to reality. This went on year after year. You know, I, that, that would remind me if I went to some place and somebody said, boy, you got a big nose. And I went the next day and big nose, big nose, or, or you know, or stupid, or this or that, or, you know, you know, what would that be like every year to be taunted? Think about that. Every time she went to the sanctuary of God, she expected to be taunted. Hannah was reduced to tears and had no appetite. The target of verbal abuse. A lot of our kids are experiencing that today. They're being bullied today in our schools today, and it's unfortunate. Christians are being bullied on the airwaves today. They're being bullied anywhere we go today. Where's your God? If God's so good, why? You know, why this, why that? We, we feel that. We're being taunted and bullied all the time. And that's why I, I just, I applaud you for hanging in there because Christians are often mocked and ridiculed and insulted. And this woman caused great distress in Hannah's life. Like name calling, you're unproductive, you're unprofitable, Anna. You can't even produce a child. People are stigmatized in our culture today, ostracized, devalued today, rejected, they're scorned today, they're shunned today. They experience discrimination, attacks, so on and so forth. We, we live in that culture today, and it's terrible. But year after year, listening to this, well, I want to just jump down to her husband now. Let's jump down to that. We talked about her struggle with her faith. We talked about her struggle with her foe. How about her family? We know that he loves her, but notice this. Why are you crying, Hannah? Elkanah would ask. Why aren't you eating? Why be disheartened just because you have no children? Notice those words. They're harsh. Why are you so discouraged and downhearted just because you don't have no children? One thing I've learned talking to this couple that lost Christopher, they just said, you know what, they have to be very careful what they say to each other. Because one's up one day and the other one's down the next. And they told me that out of the situation that they're experiencing, 80% of the people that experience the loss of a child in their marriage usually divorce. Only 20% make it. And there's times, and I thank God, that two are better than one. There's times where I'm so defeated, and there's times that shark can speak in my life, and other times I could speak in another life. But there's other times, too, where, where we can just be so insensitive and say such a wrong thing to our mate. And one thing I've learned about grief, everyone processes grief differently. Some can get through it quickly, others can't. Grief is so personal, it's so sacred, you can't hurry it, and everyone experiences so differently. And there's people here who are thinking, why don't you just get over it, man? You've been divorced five years, why can't you get over it? Why can't you get over the betrayal? Why can't you get over the loss of a child? Why can't you get over it? And there's some things we just don't get over. Grief never ends. Sometimes it gets easier, but it never ends in this life. Something significant has been taken from us. Her womanhood was stripped from her. Her desire to be a mother, to hold a baby, to look at it in the eyes and say, Honey, I love you, was taken from her for years and years and years and being taunted because of that. And that's what I see the church do at times. They taunt their people at times. You know, we, 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 just, we make it rough for people to come to church at times. And then he says the most, the most absurd thing. Notice this. Why aren't you eating? Why are you down there just because you have no children? You have me. Isn't, isn't me better than 10 kids? Come on, dude. How insensitive, oblivious you are to her needs and her pain. Sometimes our home life can be very cruel, particularly if we're married to an unbeliever, how they can taunt us and ridicule us about God. Yeah, yeah. This guy needed some counseling, didn't he? Oblivious to her deep feelings, her dreams of having a baby. Why, why was he oblivious? You know why? Because he had some kids from Penina. He didn't have any idea what she was going through. But he wanted to pontificate and say, listen, I'm better than 10 kids. What do you think she said to him? It's not recorded. We don't know. But he did attempt to help her. And let's just jump down. I'll move quickly here. 
I want to jump down to now her, her issue with the family of God. We look at her, her prayer. We talk about her pain. We want to look at her prayer. It says, then, then Jesus taught this. This is what he said in Luke 18, 1. He just, he's taught this. He said that we should always pray, never lose hope. That's Jesus' words to us. We should always pray and never lose hope. There's the key to come back to God is keep praying. So how do we trust God again after pain and loss? How do we find hope in the middle of our struggles? Well, I think we just need to just keep praying. Just keep praying. That's all I can say. It's the only way I can think of we can strengthen our faith through life's problems is just keep praying and believing that God loves us. That he's just too wise to make a mistake and he's too loving to be cruel. We just stand on that. We stand on that. We stand on that. God is good. God is good. Prayer is the utterance of faith. Prayerlessness is the proof of unbelief. And in the midst of that, she was still hanging on and still praying. Verse 9, so Hannah ate. Then she pulled herself together, stripped away, slipped away quietly, entered the sanctuary. The priest... Eli was on duty at the entrance to God's temple in the customary seat, so she didn't quit going to church. She was still going to church. She's still praying. She was trying to surround herself with the presence of God through the body of believers. Verse 10, crushed in soul, Hannah prayed to God and cried out inconsolably. I mean, she is just in travail here. Notice that. She's in travail, bitterness of soul. She prayed and called out to God and wept sore. Her sorrow drove her to God. That was one good thing. That's when we find out about Job. Job finally realized that his sorrow was driving him to God. And he realized, even though he never got an answer for what he was going through, he did say, you know what, I always heard for you. I always heard about you, but now I know you personally. There's just something about, there's something about suffering that drives us closer to Christ. And Christ reveals more of himself to us. There's just something about that. So she prays without ceasing. She cries out to God, and God hears her groaning. Because the Bible says that he is close to the broken heart. He saves those crushed in spirit. Psalms 34, 18. Good verse to remember. Good verse. He's, he is close to the broken hearted. And God says that he gathers all of our sufferings, and he records every one of them. In Psalms 56, 8. These are good verses for us to believe in. Verse 11. Then she made a vow to God. The God of angel armies, if you take a good hard look at my pain, if you quit neglecting me and go into action for me, by giving me a son, I will give him completely unreservedly to you. I'll set him apart for a life of holy discipline. That really moves me. I mean, that really so moves me that she said, God, if you answer my prayer, I won't hold on to him. I'll give him to you. It seemed like she moved away from the fact that she wanted to be pregnant just to be pregnant. But what she always longed for was to raise the man of God and dedicate him to Christ. That really moves me as I look at that. I think about David when he was away from Jerusalem. He's forced out. I think Saul was pursuing him. And David was with his men in a canyon somewhere. And he just said, oh, gosh, man, I'm, I want some water from the well of Jerusalem. I think it was the well somewhere close to Jerusalem. You know, I just want to see what it's like to be refreshed again with the water where I used to live to be home again, to feel secure and to feel loved again, not pursued, not taunted by King Saul. And three of his men quickly separated themselves from the group of other men and they slipped through the enemy lines and grabbed some water, brought it back to David. And they said, David, here it is, man. We just want to bless you. Everything you wanted, here it is. We risked our lives, here it is for you. And David looked at it and he just said, you guys did this for me. And David did not drink one glass of that water, one sip of that water. He spilled it on the ground. He said, I cannot dare drink this. It is sacred. It's just too holy. And this is where Hannah's at. I'll dedicate him to God. It reminds me of what God did with his son, that he dedicated him to us. That's a, a, o, overwhelming to me. Her prayer should be in line with God's will at this time because God begins to seem to be moving, you know, seems to be doing something in her life. And then finally with Eli, her faith community. It so happened that she continued in prayer before God. Eli was watching her closely. Hannah was praying in her heart silently. Her lips moved, but no sound was heard. 
Eli jumped to the conclusion that she was drunk. The men in her life seemed to really be out of touch with her pain. Not only her husband, but her pastor. Didn't have any idea what was going on. Just assumed that she was drunk. He approached her and said, you're drunk. How long do you plan to keep this up? You sober up, you woman. You know, I, he jumps to conclusions. He makes this misjudgment of this woman, this pastor in his church. And I can't help, I can't help but think that how often I've done that over the years too, that people walk through that door and I've judged them, misjudged them. I don't even know their story. I see them, I think, I don't even want them here. And others, you just kind of gravitate to. They're pretty, they're cute. They look like they got their act together. They drive Lexuses and BMWs. Every pastor loves those people, you know. But those that look different, maybe tats all up and down their arms. I got a friend of mine in the back that I love. I don't want you to turn around and look at him, but my buddy, I, I love tats on guys that can do it. I, I'm a coward. I, I just don't like a needle, you know. But there, there are people who come in with with all kinds of junk and and so often we just assume that that we don't want them here we misjudge them and I really do pray as we continue what you guys have been doing the last 11 years that that we would just reach out to the brokenhearted because some people come here to worship God many of you do you just love God you want to worship it's your moment of expression of your worship collectively as a body to worship God others come here to seek God they want to find God but others here want to come to and find a safe place because they've been stigmatized they've been shunned they've been put down maybe from the community or another church and they want to know if they can fit in here there are people over the years have asked us can we come George you know our past yeah you can come you can come and I just hope that we won't jump to conclusions like Eli did here as people begin to come God begins to bring them because I want to tell you something God loves people, and he loves this fellowship, and he trusts you that you will love the people that he sends here. And every person that comes through that door is a gift of God. That's why it's so important to me that we begin to do what we can do to make sure that people not only come the first time, but they'll come back the second time. Why? Because of the acceptance they feel here and the love they feel here and the support they feel here. And that's what Char and I are gonna to try to do and work with some other people too, just to allow people to know that they're so loved. You know, somebody once said, you can't clean the fish till you first catch them. And I think that is so profound that you've got to catch the fish before you can clean them, that they come as they are. God loves them enough that he doesn't want to leave them like they are, but he wants to minister to them. Come to me, all who are heavy laden, Jesus said. Burden with religion. Come and find rest with me in peace. May God help us that we do that. We could be cruel at times. Story, just a few more minutes. About a friend of mine who was on staff with me in Canada. His name was Bruce Hubbard. Marlene was his wife. They had three children. They had a little daughter. I don't know if she was five years old and somehow she contracted cancer and she ended up dying. Bruce was part of the faith moving back then, which I was part of too, you just believed that God was going to heal and heal all the time. When she died, she was in the hospital there in Calgary. When she died, he began to raise her, tried to raise her from the dead, you know, and uh, this went on for, for about an hour. And finally, those on the staff were a little concerned about where he was going, his mental state at the time, and they just asked if he would leave, it, leave the room. He recognized his daughter was dead, and when he came back to our church, which was about 500 miles away, there was a man that greeted him at the door, and instead of just saying, I love you, and my heart goes out to you, he said, if my daughter's ever sick, please never lay your hands on my daughter and pray for her, because you have no faith. You know how often people are victimized, and they're victimized more than once than twice? I remember when I was in Canada, Pastor, and just a little short time ago, you know, I met a man and I just said, why aren't you in church? He said, George, I can find God outside the church. And I, I knew there was something deeper than that. I said, no, there's something deeper than that. Tell me what it is. He, George, he said, George, I'm divorced. And I don't want to go to church and be judged. 
Not only are you divorced and you're victimized by that divorce, socially, economically, that stigma comes on you no matter where you're at, but to be double victimized by the church too, to lose your daughter and be double victimized by a stupid man who'd say, don't ever pray for me because you're not a man of faith. The reason your daughter died is because you really aren't that strong in your faith. You can imagine only Elkanai who could have told his wife, listen, you know, get over it. You know, adopt. Don't worry about it. Or others maybe in the church would have said, you know, it's because of your, your sin that God hasn't given you a daughter or a baby. Or you're not going to be a fit woman anyhow. Or it's better that you don't even have to have a child. That way you don't have to wake up in the middle of the night and change diapers. I mean, we say the most stupidest things, don't we, at times when people are hurt and hurting. The best thing we can do is just be the presence of God there. Say nothing. Just be the presence. That's what I'm learning in hospice. I don't have to have all the answers. I don't have all the answers. But what people need is just a presence. And we represent the presence of God. And when we're there, they just feel that sense of calm. We're just there. And put our arms around people and love people. That's why I just bring them all, God. Bring them through those doors. Test us to see if we'll love them. We'll put our arms around them and hug them and nurture them and bring them into the kingdom. And let them feel like they're king's kids. Yeah. Well, I'm going to end it with one more passage that I love so much. Giving up on God. Ah, David thought that a lot of times. Think about David. Anointed king. And he doesn't even get to sit on the throne. That his men turn on him. And they join rebellions with his other two sons. Absalom and Jonah, or Ammon, I think, I can't remember, a couple of the sons, they join, they join ships with them in rebelling against him, and he just cries out and says, God, what was it all about? And he says this, and I love this, Psalms 27, 13, and 14, I'm sure now I'll see God's goodness in the exuberant earth. Stay with God. This is what he's saying. A man who's experienced such tragedy, such betrayal in his life, such pain, always on the run. Stay with God. Take heart. Don't quit. And that's my word for you today. Wherever you're at today, stay with God. Don't quit. Take heart. I'll say it again. Stay with God. Don't lose your faith. What was David telling us? That he tried, tried living without God and it just didn't work. It was too big of a challenge for him, it seems like. So he said he was going to stick with God. Stick with God. What happens at times in the events of our life can really, again, cloud our vision of God. And I just want to just share this, this little story that I've experienced. I think it's a great illustration. Uh, when I graduated uh, out of high school, I got into photography. I went to Glenn Fishback School of Photography. I started to have my own studio. Shar and I were doing studio work in, in uh, Placerville. I've always, loved, I've always loved photography. You know, I was an art major, but I could never really communicate why I painted what I painted. They would always, they would always ask us to critique, critique our work, and I, I just didn't have the vocabulary, the wherewithal to be able to do that, so I slipped into photography. But in the last few years, I haven't been doing any photography. And one of the reasons why is this. It's because I have an expensive camera, probably paid about $1,200, $1,300, $1,400 for it, but I cannot get a clear shot. I can't get something that's crisp and in focus, and I want everything that I take a picture of. If I, if I want to select a focus and soften something, that's one thing. But if I want something crisp and clear, I, I want to get it. And I bought expensive lenses to do that, but I've been unable to achieve that. So I haven't been taking pictures. The other day, a friend of mine bought a camera and said, George, let's go out and shoot. I said, I'd love to go out and shoot, but I need to find another camera. So I went to the camera store, took my camera there, hopefully that they would take it in trade. They wouldn't because it doesn't get clear shots. And I asked him, I said, why not? And he said, well, let me take a few shots. He did. He couldn't get anything clear. And he changed my lenses, put some expensive lenses on my camera, and it still didn't do it. He said, George, there's something wrong with your camera. We need to recalibrate it. Uh, interesting, recalibrate. Okay. What's that going to cost me? He said, well, it's going to be a little bit expensive, probably about $300 to get it fixed. And I thought, gosh, do I really want to pay that price? And then I thought, well, I won't use my camera unless I pay that price and get it fixed. There's times in our life when our walk with God is not clear, beloved. 
And probably I dropped my camera along the way and disturbed that camera and probably shattered the lens, I'm not sure. Or the shutter inside there. And there's times where we feel dropped by God and we don't have clarity. And there's a great cost to recalibrate our life with God again. Because people are going to laugh at us and say, come on, you're trusting God again? That's what David used to always get accused of. You trust God and God doesn't show up. There's a great price to pay to fight your unbelief and stay in and hang in there with God. But once we do, and we align ourselves with God, God gives us new hope and new vision, and all of a sudden we begin to see a little bit more clearly that God does love us, and He's for us. For you who are struggling, I want to remind you God is for you. And maybe you just need to realign your faith, recalibrate yourself with God, stay in prayer, don't leave church, don't leave fellowship, don't give up on God. Stay in God and see what God can do. Father, I just thank you for staying with us even when we doubt you. I know times in my life, Lord, that I just screamed and yelled at you and thought, what in the heck are you doing? Anyone could be a better God than you can. And yet, Lord, you allow me just to express my anger at times, my disappointment. And Lord, you continuously just grant me grace in the midst of that. Thank you that you're beginning to recalibrate my love for you. And I pray for those who are struggling with their doubts and maybe their love for you, that you would minister to them right now. Maybe they know someone along the way that's no longer serving God and they'll be able maybe to share the story about Hannah and how she just hung in there even to the end. And Lord, we thank you for the story of Hannah because in reality you did grant her a child. She dedicated it to you and she named him Samuel. And not only that, Lord, you gave her other children, five other children. Lord, when she freely aligned her will with your will and said, Lord, this child's about you, not about me. You not only gave her the one Samuel, you gave her more. And may we get to the place and realize in the midst of what we're struggling, sometimes the focus is on us and not on you. That we don't allow you to be glorified in the midst of our suffering as Jesus was glorified by his father in the midst of his suffering. Sometimes you enter into our suffering to really be glorified. Help us not to give up, I pray. Bless your church. In your son's name, amen. Thank you for your patience. Huh? Yours, okay. yours is off and mine's on. Yeah, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Good word, good reminder. If you'd like some prayer, come on forward. The elders and ushers are up here, and we'll be up here to minister to you. Um, good word and good reminder. Uh, the Lord is moving, um, and I pray you're just uh, listening to the Holy Spirit, and we'll be a part of that. Amen? Amen. God bless.